Okay, so again, welcome. And we are here today with Emma Kern, who's a recent graduate of Hofstra University. She's gonna be talking about uh, propaganda on all sides of the, the aisle in the common, in the, in the current expression throughout the war. Really excited to hear what she has to say. Um, Emma, like I said, Emma is a recent graduate of Hofstra University and she's gonna be starting a master's and a doctorate at the new school in Manhattan this fall. Um, she's written a lot about the history of colonialism and its effects on Middle Eastern history um, and, and the representation of Middle Eastern culture in popular film and a look at uh, a investigation of a gendered look into college classrooms and participation. So a lot of, a lot of interest, including propaganda. Uh, we're really excited to hear what, what Emma has to say. Um, Sal, any other words before, uh, before Emma gets started? Yeah, I have a couple of things. I just want sure. to make a comment about Emma's presentation for what it is. Uh, we underestimate the role of propaganda as it affects our attitudes about many things, and particularly during wartime, our attitudes towards um, the enemy or the, ourselves. And I can remember as a young little boy in World War II, the propaganda we had about anti-Japanese because I was on the West Coast here, and that's where our focus was, the Great Lake. And I can still remember the uh, propaganda at that time, and it had a great effect on us. So we can't underestimate its role. And I want to thank uh, Emma for coming forward and doing this. Now, by extension of what she says, for next month on July 10th, Saturday, the 10th of July, Shandar Sandaram will be speaking about the Indian Army in France in World War I. And remember that when Britain joined World War I, August 4th, 1914, it made the war truly global and because of its vast empire. And it could draw on its resources. And one of its principal ones was its prime uh, colony, that of India. So I look forward to this. And I think this is another area of unending things we find out about World War I. And I'm really looking forward to this. But let's hear Emma's presentation about propaganda. All right. All thank yours. you so much, Sal. And thank you, Melanie. And thank you all for having me. Um, it's an honor. And I am very excited to get started um, to talk about propaganda in World War I. Um, this is a subject that is so very complex and uh, very exciting to investigate. Um, like we said earlier, um, Sal, you spoke a little bit about the effect of propaganda and how it really does affect the war um, and the wartime effort. And as I, I will show you today, how it sort of guides society um, and how it creates um, these ideas that we see um, sort of fester throughout the years to come um, and sort of come up again in World War II. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. So my first point of today is to talk about um, the beginning of the war and how the war, um, how propaganda started to form and what it looked like circa 1914 and 1915. So on the screen, we see two images. Um, we see the lovely um, poster of Irishmen, avenge the Luciana, um, join an Irish regiment today. Um, in this poster, um, this obviously came about after the sinking of this very important ship um, at the very early beginnings of the war. Um, it was a devastating uh, turn of events. It, um, it was a ship that was full of supplies and men and um, weaponry, and it was sunk. And we see this image um, being blasted throughout Europe. And we see this push of two men to join, to avenge, to fight, um, because this great tragedy is struck. And we see that 
it's a very exaggerated poster um, we were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, the waves not seeming to make any sense. Um, just this chaotic scene of fire and smoke and these people fighting for their lives in, in the, the sea, um, in this torment. And so it's really summoning up feelings of anger and hatred and revenge. Um, and it's pushing people to try and to join up, to fight, to avenge the loss of, of these men. We move to the second image of Remember Scarborough, Enlist Now. And again, another very important battle. We see off um, to uh, the right hand side of the poster, this town up in flames. And this is reoccurring. Um, this is reoccurring imagery, imagery throughout propaganda posters in the war. And we see, of course, this this figure in the in the front um, protecting all of these citizens um, and their arms are upraised. It's this, you know, like an angry mob. It's what you would imagine this, this outcry of rage. Um, and they're pointing, this figure is pointing with a sword, a sword of justice, um, a sword of revenge, so to speak. Um, onwards to war, okay? Now again, with this burning imagery, um, fire instills such a rage with us. It's a total destruction. And we see this a lot. It's very common in all forms of propaganda from World War I on, onwards. Um, you know, these people are savages. They're burning everything, men, women, children. Um, it's, you know, you must, you must fight in order to protect. Um, so we see this image come up for the glory of Ireland. Again, we're speaking to the Irish because at this time, the Irish have sort of, they want to split away from England and we need those men to fight. So again, we're pushing the Irishmen to go to fight on behalf of the British. And this woman is saying, will you go or must I? Will, uh, will I have to sacrifice because you, um, this figure here, this man who was looking very prim and proper and probably a very well-to-do wealthy man um, sitting there kind of casually with this stick, you know, his walking stick, his cane, um, and she's saying, well, if you're not going to go, do I have to, you know, I'm a woman. And so we now start to see this image of women being used. Um, and we start to see this emergence of gender stereotyping, which is very interesting. And again, you know, Belgium is on fire. This is after the invasion of Belgium. You know, the Germans are there. They're, you know, they're burning everything down in their path. Um, and you see in the distance, these three onlookers, this family, um, you know, an old woman, maybe a, a man, um, and then a child. And they're looking at what presumably is Belgium, is their home, and it's being destroyed. And so these are all reasons to push the Irishmen forward to join. Again, we, um, we see Belgium. Belgium becomes a very key point in World War I propaganda. Everybody likes to talk about Belgium, this terrible catastrophe, um, this loss of immense life um, and supplies. Um, and then they're pushing these people. They take very important, the artists take very important battles and they're saying, well, look at how bad this was. You don't want this to happen to your country. Um, you need to save them. So we also see this emergence of a savior complex. And again, the women and the children, they're running, they're fleeing from the burning buildings. On um, this, you know, you're, these propaganda posters really try and tug at your heartstrings. 
Um, and then of course we have this, you know, epitome of a soldier, um, a courageous man who's standing very firm um, and he's, you know, holding his weapon. He knows what he's doing and he is going to go and fight because of this atrocity that happened in Belgium. Let's move forward. Now, this is a very interesting poster from Australia. Now, we don't see a lot of these because Australia didn't really have a lot of um, propaganda posters that they, they created. Um, but it's now moving towards a more focus on camaraderie and um, how to keep hope alive within the regiments. So we see at the top, join together, train together, embark together, fight together. So there's a joining up of these men. Um, they're urging you to fight together, that this is not one man for himself. You must band together in order to save your country. And then um, it's also, it's also kind of creating this sense of patriotism um, and Australians love their sports, um, especially in World War I. And this is another way to get everybody together. Um, we, we see the emergence of baseball as a, a sort of a, a sport um, especially in America, we see these teams coming together in order to, you know, bond, um, to uh, waste time, what have you, um, and to get their mind off of the war. Um, now what we see, so that is all about the enlistment of men, we, and, but we see a change. We see a change when the U.S. enters the war. We also see a change within British propaganda posters where um, they, they begin uh, forcing enlistment. And so they move away from trying to get people to volunteer to basically accepting the fact that the men are going to war. How can we get the home front to support the war effort? So in these examples, these are from the US Food Administration and food was somewhat scarce in wartime and um, you needed to pinch pennies where you could. So we're seeing these posters come out of save wheat, save meat, save fats and sugars, save bread. Um, you're saving, you're trying to save your money in order to give, to buy for bonds, but you're also trying to save these items because they are not in surplus. Um, and then, so beyond that, we see and serve the cause of freedom. Again, bringing up that patriotism, bringing up that um, lust for a united, um, a united front against the war. Then again, on the right hand side of the screen, we see save, save a loaf a week, help win the war. So they're trying to get you to ration your food, to save your money, um, all for the sake of the war effort. Now here is where it gets turned. So propaganda posters become less about the home front and more about forming and manipulating the opinions of society. So we start to see these very intense images of these scary unknown figures from the East um, to come up and they're gonna take, they're gonna take your land, they're gonna take your freedoms, they're gonna take and bend your culture. And so in this image we see beat back the Hun with Liberty Bonds. Again, trying to raise money with the war effort while also scaring communities with this idea that this man is gonna come in and they're gonna kill you. Um, you've got blood dripping down his bayonet. Um, 
he's in shadows, he's in smoke, um, he's got blood on his hands, he just he's this violent aggressor and you don't want him coming into your home. Um, again, another way to enlist men and women in the war effort. Now, again, the US, so we see this, this growing trend of, um, of very aggressive, violent figures in propaganda posters. We see this more in the US than we do um, in the UK, which is very interesting. Um, we see, again, keep these off the USA, buy more Liberty Bonds. Um, the boats are soaked in, the boots are soaked in blood. Um, they've got, you know, this eagle with the crest on it. Ideally, it's, it's conjuring up an image of Germany. Um, these aggressors that will do the most harm to you that you could even imagine. Um, they, they have no mercy, they have no conscience. And again, um, this, this is a poster from the UK. Um, they're home, they're bringing up Belgium again, um, buy national war bonds, protect your home. Um, it's in the background, you see presumably a, a building in Belgium that's been absolutely demolished. Only the skeleton remains of it. There's, you know, this, this poor woman and her two children, her, her babies, and, um, they're crying because their home has been destroyed. And there's a figure in the background holding a baby you know, again, targeting women and children. You must protect your women. You must protect your children. So let's move forward again towards the end, buying the war bonds. Um, you, we have an American poster. We have a UK poster. Um, if you can't enlist, invest. So they've gotten all the men. They've gotten all the men that they can. Um, get to enlist. So now we need to turn to war bonds. Um, and you see this figure of, okay, this very strong man, this soldier beating back war, starvation, death um, with these liberty loans um, and with the sword of an American flag painted on it. Um, so really, you're, they're really pushing people to buy bonds, to save money, to buy bonds, um, all for this mythical, courageous soldier that's going to defend this country. Um, and again, with the machine gun, it's, instead of bullets being loaded, you're buying bonds, and the bonds are helping the machine um, kill the enemy. Um, so again, reiterating this idea that the bonds are what run the war. Here's another example of the US um, and they're um, creating this, this image, this stereotype of these aggressors um, as these wild, crazy um, brutes, um, the, this gorilla um, who has, a baseball bat or possibly something um, that says culture on it and it's smashing its way through the United States, holding this woman um, who's this sort of angelic figure who's, you know, she is our sacred, she is the representation of the United States, this innocent, virtuous woman. And we see again, this same image of this German brute who's going to come and destroy the world and wreak havoc. Again, here is an Australian propaganda poster. This fear of people coming and destroying what you have there and creating new Germany um, and they, very cleverly renamed all of these, these different towns, cities, um, 
like Melbourne turning into Zeppelinburg or um, Nietzscheburg is Sydney now. So this idea of destroying the culture, do you value your culture? Do you value your identity? Um, don't let these people come in and destroy that. So go fight or go buy bonds. Now let's get more into the representation of women in this, um, in propaganda. So this is by people, artists in Hollywood. And it's, we've got Uncle Sam in the back draped in this American flag. Um, and this woman, this angelic figure, she's draped in white. She is defeated. She is dying almost. Um, she is this nation's honor is basically what, you know, protect the nation's honor enlists now. This is what it's telling you. It's up to you. You have to protect her, her being the United States. So we start to see um, <clears throat> women becoming these, um, these figures of, they're becoming figures of virtue, of sacredness, um, that we must protect them. They're innocent. They can't fight in war. They must stay at home. They are the home front. And artists are very clever when they use, use women and gender roles. They, it, it strikes something within us. You must protect the old lady, as we see with this Irish, or not this Irish, it's um, this ca Canadian propaganda poster. You know, this old woman, presumably a widow, her son has probably died. Um, her husband has died. She's all alone. Um, she's got nobody left to fight for her. So you must do it. Um, we must protect her. And then we see this American poster. Um, she's trying to, she's rallying the troops. She is the person, she is the reward after the war. After you win the war, this is what you come home to this beautiful woman draped in white holding the American flag. She is the representation of America. This is what you need to protect. And finally, we see a somewhat of a guilt trip in my opinion of, well, the men who aren't going to fight, well, what are they doing? The men who aren't enlisting, the men who are at home, um, not contributing to the war effort by fighting. Well, what are you doing? You see that the women here, the, there's a Red Cross nurse. Um, actually, there's two, there's Boy Scouts. Everybody is, has a job to do. You cannot simply be an onlooker. Um, and it's guilting people into, well, am I doing enough for this? for the war effort? Am I doing enough? Again, this image of these women, they're clutching their pearls, they're, they're nervous, they're scared, they have to protect their children because if not, then they will be, you know, destroyed by those mad brutes coming over from the East. <clears throat> Finally, Finally, this is very interesting. This is a Soviet poster. Now, remember, the Russia is at a turning point, and um, the Tsar is gone. He is no longer in charge. And before the Bolsheviks come along, there was kind of this unknown flip flop happening. So, this is a great opportunity for the idea of communism to kind of appear. I mean, it's already been in the works, but now it's really sort of pushing through. And we see this happening with this poster with these, they 
created all female combat units to go fight in the war. And this was in one part used to, um, to push men who were battle weary, to push them forward and push them on saying, well, women are, are joining, why aren't you doing more? But also to say in a social capacity, look at our women, look at how capable they are, look at how equal they are to our men. So it creates this very interesting idea um, to promote certain social aspirations. So women's equality and um, the idea of communism starting um, and really coming into, into effect. And again, we're playing into this sort of stereotype of <clears throat> what women can do and what women cannot do. So in Russia, we see that women are allowed into the combat forces, but in the United States and Britain, they are not. And we definitely see this split because the women portrayed in the posters are angelic, quiet figures, who help the war from at home, but they're not, they're not going and fighting. The most that you will ever see of the battlefield is if you are a nurse with the Red Cross. And there were not propaganda posters um, showing their bravery um, or what they did. Instead, it was about the men and how they were all, they're fighting for this country. Um, so we start to see this lesser value of this lesser value being placed on women in the war effort. And so going further than that, there are not a lot of propaganda posters created by um, Germany um, at this point or Italy, um, there were some by Russia, um, but the way that they used propaganda, um, they published, Germany published books um, about the war. They had stamps that depicted battles, um, soldiers. Um, unfortunately, those have, are very few and far between. Um, and they have not really been researched thoroughly. And so it would be an interesting contrast to see um, if we could find any more of those, those pieces of propaganda um, to see how they compare to Britain's and the United States. Uh, we do know that they, um, it was not very common for um, very detailed depictions of war um, to, to be presented. Um, instead, it was actually very factual. What we see here in the United States and in Britain is this sort of exaggeration of war in order to get more people to fight. Um, we see that especially with using Belgium over and over and over again um, with the fires. Um, they, they really, it's very emphasized how atrocious and violent that battle was. However, from diaries and um, uh, reports from nurses on the ground, we really see that it, it is not as violent as it was told in the United States, which brings me to my sort of last point of how propaganda influences and shapes our thoughts about the war, um, especially during wartime. It 
this was all the news they had. They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have NPR. They didn't have podcasts. They had propaganda posters and they had newspaper articles. And you're reporting that from secondary sources. They're not coming from primary sources. They're coming from reports um, from soldiers, but then they're exaggerated. And you see that the war was very, very different than what was depicted in propaganda. And um, nowadays, so we, this was probably the prime time of propaganda and, and the news. And um, in World War II, it's more newspaper articles, radios, uh, radio broadcasts. Um, and less so you're getting the news or the, um, the reports of battles from propaganda posters. Um, but this was, in World War II, this was instrumental in um, creating these ideas, these opinions about Germans, about Italians, and um, they didn't have another source. They didn't have anybody else that could report back to them. Um, and so that definitely shaped public opinion for future wars um, and definitely affected the morale of society um, and the um, and the opinions of people when they went to war in World War II because their families have been taught this was World War I, these people are bad, don't trust them, they're going to destroy you. And that, that carries throughout even to today. And with that, I think um, my presentation is done and we can open up into questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, let me um, just get set up here so that we can go into the Q&A. Um, just give me one second. Emma, I'd like to add one more thing. The French yes. created great posters as well. Yes. In World War I. But they all did. Actually, they all did. And it, the best proof I have about the success of the Allied posters is that um, before World War II, I don't know whether it was Goebbels or someone who was the head of the German propaganda, but said it was better than anything they ever produced. So to their credit, uh, the Allies yes. had far superior propaganda. They uh, definitely did. They definitely knew what they were doing when they created these posters. Um, and yes, the French also had some incredibly um, powerful uh, images that they disseminated throughout. Um, that would be a whole other presentation. <laughs> I have another point I'd just like to know from you. How widely distributed were these posters and this propaganda? Everywhere. I mean, you see them all the way from New York to California. You saw them everywhere you went. Um, or you saw copies of them um, or um, sort of riffs off of the original images, um, which makes it challenging to research. Um, but yes, they, I, they were widely distributed. They got, word got around. Hey, thank you. Um, may I say something or am I on? You are on. I'm on, good. Well, as a, not making the First World War, but the second, uh, as a small child, um, you could get even slight, small, in a small way, get even with our adversaries by, uh, there were three images. One is Tojo, maybe you've seen this, Tojo, Hitler, and Mussolini. And they were done in plaster. And yeah. but they were very decorated and painted, and uh, they certainly looked like uh, uh, a good image of, of all three, and they were used as ashtrays. 
So they had their mouths open and you could, my folks never had one. I, you know, I lobbied. I just thought those were just the cat's pajamas. I lobbied that we should have some. My father smoked and his friends smoked, but uh, we never made, we never did get our three, but it was still, it was rather interesting that you could put out your cigarette butt in Hitler's mouth. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, that is very fascinating. Yeah, we see this sort of mixed media come into play in World War II. Um, and yeah, it's definitely your, it's a, it's a very big insult. Um, and so you kind of, you get your revenge. Yes. You get to stamp out your cigarette or your cigar in their mouth. And, you know, that's the final word of the day. Well, we were in, uh, we had a little uh, minor uh, automobile problem many years ago in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and happened to visit. Uh, there's a neat little Victorian cut stone house, house turned into a museum. It's South Dakota's first US, elected U.S. Senator, Richard Pettigrew. And uh, he was charged uh, in by Wilson's Espionage Act and uh, because he said to the cat that World War I was a capitalistic scheme to further uh, enrich the wealthy and advise young men not to sign on. That didn't go over too well, but it, it also, as far as all this business about Belgium, he more or less said Belgium had what they had, what they got, they had coming in spades and they deserved no sympathy because of what they did to the Congo. So I, I found that rather interesting, you know. Thank you. Um, can I be heard now? This is Mitch Gitten. Yes, go ahead, Mitch. Okay, um, Melanie, thank you for a fascinating presentation. But I'm afraid I have to differ with you on your uh, treatment of the Belgian atrocities. I would recommend to everyone a somewhat older book by this brilliant British um, journal historian, um, Max Hastings, Hastings called Catastrophe, the Coming of the World War I. The, the Germans took hostages in Belgium and shot them as supposedly franc terreurs, which was a term from the Franco-Prussian War. They burned completely the medieval city of Louvain and its priceless library of two to three hundred thousand medieval manuscripts. And they took millions of forced laborers from Belgium and France into uh, Germany to work on the war factories. If ever there was a justified war which justified the Allied propaganda. This is at least my take. That's it. Oh, I agree. I agree. I think um, that the propaganda did speak to that, um, but it was just this reoccurring image of remember what happened to the Belgians, you know, remember what happened there. Don't let that happen to you kind of thing. And um, I'm not saying that that did not occur. It was a, an atrocity. It's just a, all propaganda. It just capitalized on that. Well, um, war, uh, is, war is terrible. I see yeah. and commend you for noting Scarborough. But it wasn't just Scarborough. It was um, uh, Hartlepool and uh, one other city, I forget, that was oh. shelled by Admiral Hipper's um, pool and shelled by Admiral Hipper's uh, fleet. So uh, trying to, to find some clean hands for the Germans is a, is a futile uh, exercise. I mean, what, what amazes me is that the, uh, the U.S. ultimately went in on the side of the Allies and made the decisive difference. The Allied mm -hmm. armies were totally worn out. Um, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I thought I got Melanie and Emma uh, confused, but the Allied armies were totally worn out at the uh, middle of 1918. It was the French American soldiers that ultimately uh, won the war. Yeah, so I, were the Germans. What'd you say? 
the Germans were worn out too. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. Hi. Uh, could I speak? Hi, Shandar. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I have a couple of points um, that I want to make. Um, first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. And I think um, um, uh, to Sal's point at the beginning about uh, about anti-Japanese propaganda, there's this. I wonder if he's aware of this brilliant book. It's called War Without Mercy. It's by a guy named John Dower. It came out in 1988. And he's got this brilliant poster, uh, which is, I don't know if all, if all of you can see that. It's of a Japanese soldier as a gorilla, you know, and he's rampaging, marauding around uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Allied things. And on the other side, after the war, this is how the Japanese soldier is depicted as a little toy on top mm -hmm. of the uh, on top of the GI soldier uh, shoulder, you know. And this is uh, um, you know on the their the Marine Corps leatherhead uh, um, uh, magazine or whatever. So I mean, I think I think poster art had an equally important part to play in the Second World War. Uh, secondly, I think, um, you know, um, I'm just wondering, you know, those posters that showed of the Irish, uh, directed to the Irish thing, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering whether or not you can, you can sort of, uh, you see a sort of a trend before and after the, the Irish Easter rebellion, whether or not it is intensified or whether they try a different tack or whatever, you know, because, because of course the Irish are considered a colonial troops and things like that. Also, I, you know, if you're, if you're taking this on for, for doctorate, you know, I'd suggest looking at, uh, looking at the, um, the non-English language uh, propaganda posters uh, focusing on India and the Indian army. Uh, because of course, India was an all volunteer force. They couldn't conscript people there. They had to say that, you know, this is for your family, this is for your honor, this is for your something called izzat, which is an Urdu term. And, uh, and I'm wondering whether, and there, there are quite a lot of posters which I have looked at uh, written in Urdu, which was the sort of the, the language of the Indian army. Uh, and uh, and things like that, and also posted towards um, uh, towards uh, you know the English expatriate community living in India. Uh, you know there was all that uh, that thing. Uh, uh, the other thing, uh, one other thing I want to mention is, you know that poster about uh, the the uh, uh, the uh, the Englishman sort of looking at all these people. Uh, uh, you know, uh, involved in the war effort and looking on. Uh, I'm wondering if you know about the, the White Feather campaign, which uh, the women, uh, English women, distributed white feathers to all able-bodied, men whom they thought were able-bodied who hadn't volunteered. You know, and that was a, that was a method for, uh, for shaming them, you know, uh, guilt-tripping out of this. Uh, I mean, guilt trips aren't new. They're, they go back. I mean, most of religion is based on guilt trips, I think. But anyway, the last point I have to make is I think I have to differ a bit on your interpretation of the Russian poster. Okay. Uh, I think the Russian poster, um, as, as far as I can see, uh, <coughs> Lenin and the gang were, were interested in taking Russia out of the war. They saw it as an imperialist enterprise. So I don't think they would have been, <coughs> been the ones uh, behind that poster. And their uniforms themselves seem to me to be Second World War rather than First World War. They're also gender bending in that the women are wearing trousers, which was a faux pas in 1914, 1980. Even the, <coughs> even the nurses wore uh, skirts. So I think, um, I think it was more from the Second World War uh, where where the Soviets were were involved in a life and death struggle, 
against Nazi Germany and in fact won the war in, uh, in Europe. Um, anyway, uh, those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank is, you. Yeah, those are all good points. Does anybody know if there were Japanese pro-war posters? Because the Japanese were firmly allied with the Triple Entente and they uh, picked up a lot of German colonies in the Pacific and uh, uh, a Qingtao on the mainland of uh, China fighting with the allies. If you look at uh, Dower's book, uh, I'll again show you a Japanese poster. Um, Great. This is, a, this is an anti, uh, anti-allied poster. You see Roosevelt and, and, and it's bemoaning the, the American notion of liberty. You know, it's skewering the, uh, uh, the Americans with their own petard is sort of, you know, Lady Liberty is lo looking downwards. But, and, but that's, and Roosevelt seems like he's thumbing his nose at everything, you know? But that's World War II. I'm talking about World War I, where the Japanese were allied with the Triple Entente and fought against... No, I, I think... I think you're mistaken. I think the Japanese were allied with the Allies in, uh, throughout World War One. That's how they scooped up all the German colonies. Yeah, that's what I'm the, saying. The Triple Entente was the Allies. Yeah, the Triple, triple was, Alliance. Yeah. The Triple Alliance right. was the Germans, Italy, and Austria-Hungary. Right, exactly. But uh, but I think uh, I I haven't seen any evidence of that. But it, it would be an interesting thing for for Emma to research if she so wants to. Yeah, definitely. I will definitely take note of all of these comments and definitely look further into it. Um, it's history is a, a deep, dark hole that you can just dive into and never get out, which is what makes it so exciting. I have a quick question, Emma. I, I, I saw that the one uh, picture, the one poster you, uh, one poster you put up has uh, was for the Irish Canadian Montreal based. Yes. And uh, there was a you know, they they were they were riffing on um, Whistler's mother that that famous portrait of Whistler's mother, and I just I'd uh, I don't know if I've seen a World War One poster that is <coughs> using a a, uh, a I guess what was sort of a contemporary ish image. Are there are there other posters that use well known paintings or or are are reinterpreting well known paintings? You know, I haven't thoroughly researched that, um, but I'm sure they did use references from certain poster, cer from certain um, paintings um, of royalty, and I'm sure that they are out there. Yeah, I'm done. I'm just wondering what was, because I think that painting, I forget when that painting was painted, but I don't think it was so old, you know, it was not that old by the time of World War One. And I wonder if Whistler was on board with this, or, or if he wasn't on board. You know, you 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 hear yeah. a lot of that now. With, um, for example, I know that um, like politicians using music of using famous songs, right? And the musicians uh, not agreeing with this because they don't want their music used in the service of X or Y politician. So I, I I'm uh, th that caught my eye. Yeah, that was a good catch. <laughs> Were there any posters about the Kurraw mutiny in uh, Northern Ireland just before Britain's entry into the war against Germany? That was a pretty vicious um, thing. You know, not in my research. Um, I have not come across that. Um, it, it might have it might have been too short in duration, yeah. and it was something that the the British wanted to sweep under the carpet because it was potentially so totally destabilizing. Yes, that I think exactly. That's why it probably was not capitalized on in propaganda. Uh, how, how early did the U.S. propaganda start? Because. Wilson campaign on keeping us out of war, didn't he? He did, but as soon as the U.S. entered the war, you did see a, a 
very large uptick in propaganda posters, um, especially pushing Liberty bonds uh, or, and, and um, war bonds. But what happened in the prior three years and was there an outburst of propaganda after the sinking of the Lusitania? In the United States? No. Yes. Well, there is a famous poster about that sinking where the woman with the baby in her arms yes. sinking into the water, which have very effective uh, what do you have, image on World War I. But there's something else that should be said also is the fact that- uh, If someone has a background noise, can you mute yourself? There's a, it sounds like there's a-, a lot Yeah, of my neighbors, maybe. He's too busy doing- uh, Oh, it's you, Sal, sorry, okay. Go ahead, Sal. Sorry, I just I thought it was some something. I thought it was somebody else. Sorry. No, it is me. It's me. It's the background is in my neighbor next door is putting in something. Anyway, I just want to mention the fact that propaganda in World War One uh, was more effective whenever yeah. it showed the truth, and that was one of the images of the sinking of the Lusitania, which really turned America against Germany at that yeah. point. Uh, because it was, you know, a ship, although it was loaded with weapons, and we do know that now, uh, it was uh, very effective in turning America's attitude towards the Germans. Is, Sal, was there an outburst of propaganda after the Germans resumed unrestricted uh, submarine war? Oh, yes. Oh, by golly, yes. I mean, uh, it was an image actually... Um, if the Germans had not uh, adopted that process, they would have lost the war even earlier. Mitch, uh, there. I, oh, sorry. The <clears throat> Committee of Public Information under George Creel is primarily the one that starts right. uh, the American propaganda, uh, and there is a lot of different divisions under the committee or CPI. Um, one of them being posters, films, everything else. So it's basically Wilson selects Creel, who's actually a Kansas City native, and literally his house was just down the street from me when he lived here in Kansas City. So, um, but that's sort of after we declare wars, when we really, as Emma has said, sort of rev up, quote unquote, of the American propaganda component. He was a great a great leader. He did a great job. Yeah. And, and was, there, was there an outburst of propaganda after the Zimmerman telegram broke surface? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I would say so. Yeah. So, uh, sorry. Can, can people hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Hi. Something, <laughs> sorry. Some time ago, there was a there was a talk by Whistler's mother uh, being used as a propaganda tool, and I have a illustration of uh, of G King George the Sixth in uh, Indian regalia, in Indian regimental regalia. It's fabulous. Uh, and this was Fifth. used as a propaganda poster during the First World War too. So. So there, there are numerous examples of artwork being used. Whether or not they're copyrighted or not is another thing entirely, but, uh, but they were used. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I just meant specifically <laughs> like uh, not so much portraits of, of royal portraits as I think were, you know, so many of them are widely in circulation, but these, these non, kind of non, um, Mm. taking existing art, like existing fine art and repurposing it. Um, yeah, I think there's a, and ro you know, royal portraits are definitely one, one other thread. Well, of that. well, well considering the horrors that World War I oh. wrought, I think, I think they should have used the scream by Monk myself. If you're aware of that picture, you know. The, the scream by by Edward Munch? Yes. You know, right. I think they should have used that world over, but but of course that is going against the 
sort of jingoist or propaganda that they used. <laughs> All right, I gotta go get a glass of water. Um, are, uh, so thanks, Sandra. Thanks everyone for the comments. We should wrap it up in just a few minutes here. So are there any other questions or comments? Um, oh, and Tim, I did see you had a question. Sorry, I was remiss. I see you had a question about who, who George Creel's uh, counterpart was in Great Britain. I don't think we got to that question yet. Um, so um, let me just click over, where's Emma here? So uh, yeah, Emma, Tim, Tim was asking who, who was the counterpart of George Creel in the UK? You know, I must confess that I do not know the answer to that. No worries. <laughs> I have it written down somewhere, um, but of course. We can no, eat that with one. me. <laughs> no problem. Emma, there was more than one in England. Um, I have a question. Um, I came late. I had to have be on another meeting. Um, where can I access the recording? Uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, if you just Google YouTube World War One HA. You okay. Will. And I can also just give me a second, everyone, because I do have the link. Let me just copy it for you. Just give me one second. And I had a quick question uh, about the Lusitania. My understanding, I haven't looked this up for a while, but my understanding was that while it was subsequently found to be true that the Lusitania did have munitions in it, that was not known and may have even been covered up. It was. it was. It was, yeah. Okay. But the Germans knew about it. And, yeah. uh, and Victoria is the only place outside Britain where there was a Lusitania riot, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that's right. Now, the key question at the time was, uh, why did the ship sink in like 15 minutes? It's supposed 18, to be- uh, 18 huh? minutes. Whatever. It's in 18 minutes. Whatever. But, you know, the point is that's rather rapid for a supposedly unsinkable ship. And, you know, when they searched the wreck years later, well, they blew the bottom of the ship out when, they, when the munitions exploded. So uh, it's hard to stay afloat with no bottom in the ship. Yeah, that would be rather difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sundar, we look forward to your talk next month. I really do. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sal. Um, so any other final questions before yes, we wrap up? Melanie, is there any attempt to publish a book with all these posters? Yes. Oh, yes, there are books out on this. I have one. And what's, it called? what's the author's name, please? Oh, it's just propaganda of World War One. That's all it is. Okay. Thank oh, you. Um, I can see. Your, um, I know our book. I know our bookshelf section on the website needs some. Maybe needs uh, some updating. I know. I think it's been a little while. So, uh, Mitch and everyone. I know you've been and Jim. You've recommended some books. So um, I can talk with Randy and and our new web person. We have a new web person. So looking to do some some updates on the web, maybe get some of these more recent recommendations of books that we've gotten up on the website so they're easy to access for everyone. Um, Melanie, Tim, yes. Yes, could, Tim. Um, would you mind just adding that under our new business for tomorrow, please? Will do, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and, and again, I commend to everybody Max Hastings catastrophe it's in paperback it's it's hypnotic i'll put that in the chat super quick sorry i'm typing sorry for the sound there i'm yeah. gonna spell catastrophe because i'm going too fast okay i think i got it right um all right we yeah we should uh we should wrap up thank you so much to to Emma, thanks so much and wish you the best of luck as you embark on your grad studies this fall. That's really exciting. Um, thank you. Thanks everyone. Hi um, everybody. Hi Jim. Hi Jim. Hi Jim. Hi Jim. Just a reminder, if, you have, if you're have, if you not an active member, uh, if you haven't uh, put those dues in in a little while, please, please do if you're not sure. 
you can just email me, okay? All right, Melanie, give, give the YouTube ad address again of the how to see the program. The YouTube? Yep. Yeah. I have a question for Sal. Yes. Uh, when do you think we can start our our face to face meetings again? Oh, you're missing my desserts. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I can't say that right now. I have strict orders that the building where we met has to be used only by um, veterans of World War One. Uh, oh really? Yeah. Oh. Strict orders from the county. Veterans of World War One. There aren't any. <laughs> I mean, no, not World War. I mean. It can only be used by um, members of the American Legion, period. That's all. Huh. It's rather limiting. It is. All right, Melanie, okay. thank you very much for your Thank you, everyone. For thank you, thank you, Bye, Bye, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for later. a nice talk. See you next month. Okay. See you next month. Bye. Bye. Thank you Bye guys now. for having me. Thanks a lot.